Hello and welcome to the Inner Sense channel. How much can your beliefs and expectations influence very real physical changes inside your body? The answer to that is likely to be more than what you previously realised. Today we're joined by science writer David Robson to talk about what he learned whilst researching for his excellent new book, The Expectation Effect. At the core of David's message is this idea that we are prediction-making machines. Our brains don't just wait around to sense what's happening in the world around us before acting. It has consequences for how dieters digest food, how people with allergies respond to the exposure to their allergen, how students per perceive studying. It even can alter life expectancy. I'm sure you'll love what David has to share. Please remember to subscribe to the Inner Sense channel for more information about inner body awareness and interoception. Thank you very much. Morning, David. Thank you very much for joining us on the Inner Sense channel. I was wondering if we could start by just hearing a little bit about your background and how you ended up as a science writer specialising in the extremes of the human brain, body and behaviour. Right. Yeah, it wasn't um, a straightforward path. Um, so I studied mathematics at Cambridge University. Um, and then, you know, very quickly while I was uh, doing my degree, I realised that actually I really missed kind of the creative process of writing, like I'd always loved um, kind of English literature at school. Um, and so it really seemed like the best way to combine those interests was to become a science writer. Um, I, I uh, first of all became an intern and then a feature editor at New Scientist, then moved to the BBC where I was a uh, senior journalist um, covering uh, neuroscience, psychology and medicine. And then I left to write my first book, The Intelligence Trap. And while I was writing The Intelligence Trap, I also came across all of this fascinating work on the expectation effect, which became the subject of my second book. Great, that's quite a, an impressive background. It's funny, actually, we had last week, I spoke to Caroline Williams, and I didn't appreciate yeah, yeah. when you were both queued up to, to be on the Inner Sense channel, I didn't appreciate that you were colleagues at one point at The New Scientist. We were, yeah, uh, very close colleagues, actually. Yeah, we were both features editors, and um, Caroline was like a mentor to me, really. So, yeah. Great. Well, you've uh, both written some excellent books since leaving The New Scientist. So the, the book which uh, I'd like to focus on today, or the topic of the book, is called The Expectation Effect. So what's The Expectation Effect all about, and what's the basic scientific explanation behind it? So the expectation effect describes this phenomenon where our beliefs become self-fulfilling prophecies um, through changes to our behaviour, our perception, and also our physiology. Um, I'll say the, the most famous example of this, something that most people are familiar with, would be the placebo effect in medicine. So we know that if you give someone a placebo pill, a dummy pill, but you tell them that it's a real analgesic, then they'll experience some kind of pain relief. And we also know that happens through multiple pathways. Um, so one of those pathways is that, you know, the kind of um, psychologically, like it's calming to receive help from a doctor. So subjectively, you're going to feel maybe a bit better emotionally because of that. But what we also know of these placebo painkillers is that they can also change our physiology. Um, so if you expect to receive a kind of placebo opioid drug, uh, what we know is that actually that triggers the release of the brain's own endogenous opioids that can then lead to pain relief too. So that's not purely subjective. That's actually you're seeing something happening in the brain that wouldn't happen if you didn't receive the placebo pill and have the expectations of receiving pain relief. So it's all happening at multiple levels. Each one um, is important for our kind of well-being and our health. Like I don't think we can really separate them and say that only the physiological effects are meaningful because also for patient comfort, the subjective effects are too. But together, they are very powerful. So it's all about expectations and beliefs. I, you know, uh, you, you could say sort of playing devil's advocate, what's all the fuss about? We all know that we expect things. We, you know, we, for, we think about what the weather's going to be and change our clothing. Um, we worry about things that might happen in the future. So we kind of know that that happens today, day to day. How does the science of expectation effect differ from other views of cognition or, you know, other main, main views that we may have as a culture? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, like you say, like expectation is just a part of the way we work. Uh, like we have to be consciously kind of preempting what's going to happen um, and then change our behavior accordingly. But I think what's important here is that these expectation effects are often um, happening below our conscious awareness. Like we don't realize how our expectations are shaping our lives. Um, you know, um, I don't think most people realize, for example, that when they're eating their um, expectations of the food's calorie contents is actually changing their digestion. So how quickly it moves through their gut and even the hormonal response to that food. So whether they see the um, desired reduction in the hunger hormone ghrelin, which stimulates appetite, or whether the ghrelin remains high and they get hunger pangs later. You know, I don't think that's familiar to most people. So that's what this new research is really doing, is showing that actually in all of these different areas of our lives, and I, I talk about exercise, diet, sleep, stress, um, willpower, um, and aging, you know, in all of these areas that actually our expectations are shaping our, our uh, perceptions and our behavior and our physiolo physiology really powerfully. Mm. Um, yeah, and I enjoyed those really powerful examples in, in your book. So, and I hope we can cover a few of those in a few moments. But first of all, uh, before we dive into those examples of the expectation effects, can you share um, maybe how what you've learned whilst researching all of this, um, these phenomena, how it's helped you in your own life? Yeah, I mean, it's helped me tremendously. Um, and actually, the inspiration for the book um, came partly from a personal experience. So um, alongside the placebo effect, we have the nocebo effect. Um, so that's where even if patients are receiving a dummy pill, if they're told that that uh, drug is going to come with some side effects, they experience those side effects. And the mechanisms are actually very similar to the mechanisms of the placebo effect. So changes in hormones, changes in your cardiovascular response, digestion, and you know the changes in the neurotransmitters within your brains. Um, now that was, um, uh, in my life, I experienced this when I was prescribed some antidepressant pills. And my doctor told me that one of the common side effects was uh, migraines. Um, and like the pills did really help to improve my mood and to just kind of level, make me feel kind of more emotionally stable. But at the same time, um, I did experience these really bad migraines to the point that I was considering um, being weaned off the pills because they were so frequent and so painful. Um, but it just happened that during that period, I was writing an article about the nocebo effect. And so I discovered that, that this phenomenon existed. And I also discovered that actually in the trials of the uh, antidepressants that I was taking, that you do see a strong nocebo effect with these headaches. So in any clinical trial, you have people taking placebos, which are compared to the real drug. And you saw that actually the people taking the placebo pills, because of this warning of the side effect of the migraines, they were actually experiencing the migraines at almost the same rate as the people taking the active drug. There was almost no difference. Um, so that realization that actually the the pain might have just been caused by my expectations. Uh, that proved to be incredibly liberating. So I read that paper in the morning, went out for lunch, and in the afternoon and evening, like by the evening, the pain had almost completely vanished and didn't come back. And that just showed to me how powerful our expectations could be. And it showed that actually, you know, we, we can talk about something being like all in someone's head and we can be dismissive about that. But actually this pain was very real and debilitating for me. And it could have changed whether I... The course of the treatment, which actually proved to be very effective, so it seemed like it was it could have had a really important effect on my life, and and that really then encouraged me to look for all kind of other areas um, where expectations might be shaping my well being. Um, and you know, then I kind of I've applied everything that I've written about in the book. I wouldn't say there's any any single chapter where I haven't tried it myself, um, and that's because I just find it so inherently useful. It's like if you know this, why not apply it? Um, but also, I wouldn't feel comfortable with writing about techniques that I didn't think were personally practical. Um, I think, you know, it's mm -hmm. important to try it out and just see whether what's been learned in the lab can actually be implied, you know, with all of the other additional challenges you have in everyday life. That's what I really liked about the book, that at the end of each chapter, you do give some um, simple steps that people can use to uh, use that knowledge for that particular aspect of our, of our life. Um, so that's... That's incredible. So did, did you, had you ever suffered migraines before taking that medication? No, not really. Wow. I mean, not, not so free, you know, it's every day. Like I've, I've, I mean, I've always had like 
been pretty free of like headaches to be honest mm. like uh, you know I would have like the occasional headache but never like a really bad migraine and then it did wow. come on very quickly after taking the antidepressants yeah and do you remember reading the warning or was it something you maybe scanned down and didn't really know that you'd taken yeah. in that because there's always quite a long list of symptoms aren't there that on medication usually there are and my doctor you know kind of she said, I mean, she said, oh, there'll be like a range of possible side effects, but she did specifically point out the migraines, which I think is mm. why it was so salient for me. Mm. Yeah. What surprises me here is someone who's ne- maybe had headaches but never had a migraine, they, they can be quite two very different things in terms of mm. how they manifest. Um, so it seems that, you know, that this expectation effect can create symptoms in a way that we maybe haven't experienced before. And I know you talked about the the, yeah. the shamans and the bone pointing and, you know, how dramatic <laughs> mm, <laughs> physical yeah, symptoms yeah. Can, can be. Yeah. You know, most people have heard of the placebo effect, so I don't want to dwell too much on that today. Yeah. But you did give some really interesting um, facts about the placebo te- effect that um, I hadn't really heard about before. So, for example, that it can... Um, you know, it's it's been shown to increase over the years. Um, what uh, did, were there any other things about the placebo effect that you learned that were quite surprising to you? Yeah, there were. I mean, and I think what's most exciting for me is that um, the placebo effect has gone from being this phenomenon that doctors were trying to, um, were like, well, doctors I think knew that it could be helpful for patients, but they had this dilemma that you can't deceive a patient because that would then reduce patients trust in the medical profession which would have knock-on consequences that would be terrible so you can never give them this placebo treatment even if you suspected it could be quite helpful in reducing their discomfort um, but what's happened recently is that the researchers have shown that actually um, you can reap the benefits of placebos without actually deceiving the patients um, one example is just to use the open label placebo so you actually give people a big jar of like orange pills that very clearly says like placebo pills take two a day. Um, And what the researchers did was they just told these patients with chronic pain, um, chronic back pain, you know, they explained the placebo effect basically in the mind body connection, how our expectations can kind of, you know, actually have these direct effects on our body. Um, And then they gave them the pills. So there was no deception there, but they had raised the patient's expectations of what they might, what benefits they might receive anyway. And then that proved to be effective. So it resulted in a 30% reduction in their symptoms, which is the kind of threshold for clinical significance. So it was, you know, it was actually improving their lives quite profoundly to the same level that you would hope for like, other treatments. Um, And what was even more amazing about that was that they followed the patients uh, for five years afterwards. And it seems that just this knowledge that their their brain and their expectations, their mindset was capable of of helping to relieve their pain, that that actually then helped them even five years later. So they were in a better state than a control group who had just been on a waiting list receiving the normal treatments, but without the placebo pills as this additional kind of help. So it's quite profound um, that you it's almost like the knowledge is power. Like once you understand the mind body connection, that that can itself be really useful. That really is incredible. So they knew they were taking a dummy pill. Um, they benefited from it, even though they knew it was, there was nothing in it. And that effect lasted for five years. I guess um, I see it as being like, um, it was empowering them to realize mm-hmm. that to a certain extent, their pain was within their control. And that, um, yeah, I mean, that's what I think is so incredible about this. And I heard that from lots of other researchers is that actually you do often see these knock-on effects that once people have tried an expectation effect and found it to succeed, that they do find that empowering and then manage to apply it in different ways that the researchers hadn't necessarily expected. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that word, I think, empowering is important. And, um, you know, because there's so many ways that people may feel disempowered in their lives you know either d- deliberately from um deliberate intention of other people or just subconsciously from the ideas they pick up um I, I, in fact i think your book is um is has a kind of empowering effect it is empowering the whole thing after I, as i was reading it and i listened to it on audio as audible as well you know i felt my mood was lifted and my confidence and you know i was thinking how can i apply this in other areas of my life where i may be kind of 
subtly applying the nocebo without realizing and then changing that so yeah that was totally my aim actually was and because this is what I try to explain to people when they ask is this just like a positive thinking book and well what I'm not asking people to do is to go out and just like imagine the impossible and imagine and then to hope that you know like riches are going to just come to them through some power of attraction but what I do want people to do is to really to just question whether their expectations are unnecessarily negative and then to kind of just bring them up to something that's a bit more objective you know and that I think is where you see the biggest changes you don't have to like be you know like um a Pollyanna kind of figure who's relentlessly optimistic but you can just try to think like are my worst expectations really objective or am I actually being needlessly pessimistic Mm -hmm. and be reassured that you know whatever the case, some very real things will be happening in our body. So it is, like you say, it's not just, you know, imaginary thinking there. Every time we we think something or have a belief, then there's an associated physiological change. Exactly. Yeah. Um, food and appetite were quite uh, sort of recurring themes throughout the book. Yeah. And you uh, included some really clever studies that showed the effect of branding and marketing that they can act like placebos for food and alter our expectations around food um including snacking and stuff so what's going on there is that the same as taking you know a a pill with a description of what might be happening yeah a little bit i mean in a way i think you know you could see food as just being well i mean like we're, we're seeing the same effect as you do with drugs it's like yeah the, your interpretation of your food is going to shape your body's response. But um, just to give some specific examples, so we know that the um, for things like appetite, we know that the gut does have its own kind of sensors that can roughly estimate how much you've eaten. But we also know that's like really inaccurate. So it's like a, so vague, like it's not really going to tell you much. And we know that from amnesic patients who aren't able to form new memories. Eventually, you can give them a meal. And they'll eat it. And, you know, their senses should be telling them that they're full. But because they don't have the memory of having eaten, they're still quite hungry and can still like eat a second plate or even a third plate of food uh, without feeling um, satiated. So, you know, it's, um, uh, we know that there's much more to eating than just like what feedback we're getting from the gut. Um, and so expectations are a big part of this. If you believe you're eating a big meal then that's going to change how you read those signals and how full you feel Um, and in terms of marketing that's really important because if you're on a diet and you're eating like this diet food that is emphasizing how few calories it has and it's you're being told that it's kind of sensible and healthy but you're not being told it's kind of satisfying and delicious then that's going to change the way that you interpret those signals Um, so subjectively you're going to feel hungrier because of that because you're your brain isn't recalibrating to to realize that it's actually had enough to kind of go on. Um, On top of that, then we, so that's the perceptual side. And then on top of that, we see the uh, physiological side. So we know that if you have this expectation or this kind of sense of scarcity of deprivation, if you feel you've eaten something, but that it's not really satisfying or enough for you, then that changes things like those hormone levels. So scientists did this where they gave participants exactly the same milkshakes on two separate occasions. But in one, they told them it was this kind of low-fat, low-calorie health shake. And the other time, it was this uh, decadent, indulgent, delicious treat filled with cream and ice cream. They actually sh- saw different hormonal responses. And that it was the people with the, who had the decadent treat um, who sh- saw the reduction in the hunger hormone ghrelin. So they felt more satisfied just purely through their expectations. And that was changing how the body had responded to that food. Um, And this is like really important for dieting because, you know, if you're only eating these dishes that you perceive to be unsatisfying um, and then you're not having the hormonal response that will help to reduce your appetite, you're going to have like worse hunger pangs later on. Um, You're going to find it much harder to snack, uh, to resist snacking later on. Um, And I think this is just one of the big reasons why dieting is so difficult, uh, partly it's not because our bodies can't cope with having less food, but it's because um, we're kind of not not adjusting our brain's expectations in the mm. right way. So we're kind of setting ourselves up to feel that extra mm. hunger and to feel that pain. Yeah, and that's, I mean, we could dive into the biochemistry of that, which we pro- probably won't do, but this, 
you know, when you start talking about things like ghrelin and leptin and mm. um, maybe insulin levels as well, and and then we, it's not far to to start talking about fat storage, and uh, and then so maybe the expectation of the food will affect how much food will, how many calories will pack away as as fat. I, yeah. I consider myself really lucky that um, I've always seen healthy food as um nourishing and filling and right. you know so i've had that expectation and it wasn't until reading your book that i kind of saw myself yeah, well, i'll backtrack a little bit in the in the book you you sort of compared two different cultures so you looked at um american and french and how they had different perceptions of what healthy food is and what indulgence is so i consider myself a little bit more like a french person than an american person can you say about a little bit about those different Cult, you yeah. know, cultures and how that maybe affects how we process food. Yeah, and I mean, this was definitely true in the past, but um, I have seen some evidence that actually even France is becoming a bit more American. <laughs> in oh, okay, food, doesn't, food. doesn't surprise um, me. Yeah, I know. I think that's, I don't know if, you know, I think we need more studies on that, but definitely in the past, it seemed that in countries like the UK and America, we had this kind of um, uh, intuition that um, healthy foods are unsatisfying and healthy foods aren't tasty. Uh, but in France, it was the opposite. So if you asked them to kind of, for word association for what they would have, like if you ask them like what comes to mind when you say healthy, they would say delicious. Um, so, you know, a very different attitudes. Whereas in America, it would be like healthy would be like starving or hunger, like, you know, like um, very different mindsets that then seemed to have seem to correlate with the kind of things like measures of BMI in these countries, how quickly they take to eat their meals. So in France, it's much more common for people to take their time to eat a meal, um, maybe getting more enjoyment from the food, from the food, even though they're eating smaller amounts of the food, lower calories, you know, all of that. So yeah, it's very much part of these cultures. And like, it seems like then that could be linked to um, how they you know, like to the actual like uh, differences in their health. I must admit, that's one thing I I perhaps need to work on is eating a little bit more slowly. So, do you have any other tips for creating healthy expectations around our food? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, so I think there's lots of things that we should try. Um, I guess the first thing uh, would be that, like, when you're di- if you're trying to lose weight. Um, it's easy for you to just like choose the foods with the lowest calories and to think like to be kind of puritanical about it to almost see it as like an act of punishment and to be like it doesn't matter if I don't enjoy this my aim is to lose weight so I'll have fewer calories but that's setting up this mindset of deprivation that's counterproductive and is going to make the whole process so much harder to stick to um Mm -hmm. so actually when you're dieting I think like even if you have to put in a lot more kind of research and effort, you should really be looking for the foods that might have fewer calories, but that also are like especially delicious and appealing to you. So actually focus more on the taste there. Um, that's really important, I think. And like personally, you know, um, my own attitudes to food have changed quite a lot over my lifetime. Um, and But now I definitely do, you know, like find healthy foods, like super satisfying. But if I am trying to lose a bit of weight, you know, I would just pay more attention to kind of adding like flavor enhancers to the dishes that I'm having. So, you know, like a bowl of broccoli, um, I think can be quite delicious in its own right. But I think also if you add like chili to that or anchovies or Parmesan cheese, like you're adding a few calories with that. But actually, I think the effects of those intense flavors is going to make the meal feel so much more satisfying that um, you're going to feel full up and less likely to snack later on. Um, So that's one thing. Um, I think just having like a sense of anticipation before your meals. So like really like thinking about the food you're going to eat. And if it, if it is appealing, like really focusing on that kind of um, sensory pleasure you're going to get from that. Um, There's some evidence that that can do, you know, can help to kind of promote those um, helpful hormonal changes when you do actually eat the meal. Um, There's also some evidence that actually that sense of anticipation can actually reduce the size of the portion that you eat. Um, it's almost like the brain has started to realize that it can get all the pleasure it needs from fewer bites. So people do choose smaller portions and that's true if it's a big meal, but also, you know, if you're like, I'm going to treat yourself with a piece of cake, um, 
if you really imagine in detail like how delicious it's going to be eating that cake, then actually on average people choose a smaller portion because they realize that maybe like a big slice is going to make them feel sick afterwards, whereas a smaller slice is going to be more pleasurable. And, you know, that's great for their diet as well. It's just like cutting out those extra calories that aren't really adding anything to your, uh, to your satisfaction. So really to, we, we should enjoy the food and that um, fits with, or that those ideas fit with, I think the idea uh, that we're talking about on this channel a lot, which is interoception and kind mm. of actually being present and taking, being aware of what's happening inside our body. Cause even when we visualize something, you know, the body starts to create sensations and feelings just through the thought of it. So yeah, right. I, I really, I really like those tips. Thank you. You included some studies on sort of allergies. Um, and one of them was whilst we're on the topic of food to do with a peanut allergy and a, a therapy, which was kind of like a, uh, a very slow graded exposure therapy where people with yeah. extreme peanut allergies are given small amounts of peanuts um, to kind of create this oral tolerance to it so they can um, yeah. uh, cope with large amounts. So how did the expectation effect, um, what was the expectation effect? Um, how was it included in, in, in that type of therapy? Yeah, so I mean, I think this, I love this study because I feel like it um, really encapsulates, I think, like, when it perfectly encapsulates how I think we should be applying the expectation effect. And it shows why it's not just this idea of, like, you know, vague positive thinking, but it's actually just really, um, it's, like, totally honest without deception, but just reframing and reinterpreting what you're mm -hmm. already experiencing and how that can be powerful in the long term. But so with this uh, study, like you said, it's like exposure therapy, essentially. So it's um, the children um, are given just increasing doses of the protein that causes the peanut allergy until they can get to the point after six months of eating a whole peanut without having a dangerous allergic reaction. You know, that's like super important for their lives that if they accidentally eat something at a party, they're not going to die from that, you know, so they might never be able to eat like a full like walnut cake or, or whatever, but they can, you know, they know that if they take an accidental bite of something, they're going to be safe. Um, but as they go through this process of eating um, the increasing doses of the uh, peanut protein, um, they do experience some unpleasant uh, kind of sensations and effects on their bodies. So because the, the immune system is responding um, as it's kind of learning to deal with that protein. So they can, you know, get things like hives or like horrible sensations in their mouths, you know, nausea, um, all of these things that um, can be quite worrying because it feels like they're on the cusp of having like a full blown allergic reaction. Um, what these scientists did was they didn't tell them, I'll just like, you know, ignore those symptoms, <laughs> like, because uh, I would be dangerous anyway, like you have to be monitoring your symptoms. Um, but they did try to get them to reframe them. So rather than seeing the symptoms as purely uncomfortable and potentially dangerous. They tried to tell them that actually, this is a sign that the treatment is working. When you're experiencing those symptoms, it shows that we've triggered the immune system and that it's building strength. It's very much like if you go to the gym and your muscles are aching, it's because you're building strength. Well, the same thing is happening with your immune system. And they got the kids to do all of these exercises to kind of cement that um, idea in their minds so they you know, ask them to come up with their own examples, to kind of write a letter to their future self, kind of saying, uh, you know, um, kind of explaining why that was useful, you know, all of these things that just help them to kind of really process that. Um, and then at the end of the six months, they found that those children actually reported fewer side effects. So it, it seemed to have changed their experience of the treatment itself. Um, but importantly, it also seemed to change how effective physiologically that treatment was. So they had higher levels of this, of the um, a particular antibody that's actually really useful in stopping the full blown allergic reaction. It kind of acts as this kind of barrier or blocker. So it stops the, the body from overreacting to the protein. And they had much higher levels of that compared to the children in the control group who had been given some like practical advice on how to deal with the symptoms. So they were told to kind of take the protein on a full stomach or a um, and to, to drink a glass of water, but they hadn't been told to reinterpret it in this positive way. Um, so their expectations were really powerful there for improving their kind of subjective experience and their physiological 
response to the treatment. And it, you know, what they were told was completely true and honest. It was just a reinterpretation of the um, events based purely on the scientific facts. Mm. Yeah, so I, I can see how that is an example of how um, healthcare can be uh, communicated and delivered. So, and what I'm, you know, I'm um, speaking to other people, a lot of people who deal with chronic pain, and it seems like this idea of safety, um, reassurance and safety when talking to people about their symptoms is, is, really, is really important. And yeah. from what I heard there, you know, by reinforcing or reframing the symptoms of um, the immune system, yeah. the hives and whatever, as uh, as a almost a good thing, like it's yeah. and you know reassuring yeah. that their body is working okay, then that has quite a profound effect. Um, yeah. That is really is a brilliant example because it's something really measurable and real. So the immune system can be we can easily measure the immune system yeah. flaring up and inflammation, but also mm. just changing the way that people interpret that is uh, potentially life saving. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think what you're saying is totally correct. That it's actually, um, you know, like we, it's not like, you know, like we were like magical thinking here, that actually the mechanism very much is about helping people to realize that they're safe and reducing their anxiety about their symptoms. Because uh, we know that heightened anxiety can do things like increasing inflammation in the body. And in this case, it could be that those inflammatory molecules are stopping the production of the useful antibodies. So, you know, there's a very direct link there. Um, similarly with like chronic pain, like you mentioned, um, if people feel scared of their pain and um, are kind of catastrophizing that pain, then we know that that's, that's not just like increasing the kind of emotional response, but that's actually changing things like the expression of a chemical called CCK within the nervous system that can amplify the transmission of the pain signals. So it actually means so adding a loudspeaker and making sure that the brain is receiving like the painful stimulus like even more intensely than it would have been. Whereas if you give like a placebo, or you or the doctor just offers like really good reassurance that you know the pain will go away over time, and you're reducing that anxiety and helping the person to feel like they to feel empowered to cope with it then you're actually reducing the levels of the CCK, uh, which will then in turn like mean that the pain itself feels uh, a lot less intense. So yeah, I think like a lot of this is about just helping people to feel that they've got control over their symptoms and to reduce their anxiety. Great stuff. Um, and I, I could talk about just uh, pain, chronic pain all day long, but I, I would like to move on a little bit about some other for on some other topics uh, to do with our energy levels that I found particularly uh, uh, interesting from your book. And that was the idea of perceived exhaustion. Um, so this is, you know, personally, I can think of how this is useful in my own life um, in terms of um, how much the work-life balance, for example, or, um, but also training at the gym and you gave some great examples. So, um, but with my clients, I, I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time doing hands-on therapy and that, there's a lot of people who have got fearful beliefs around their um, energy levels and performance, um, whether it's because of pain or diagnosis of uh, chronic fatigue, for example. Um, can you share some examples of what you learned about expectation and exhaustion, please? Yeah. So I think like in, say, in the gym, first of all, um, we now know that people's expectations of what their bodies are capable of can have a really profound effect on things like the fatigue they experience during endurance exercise. Um, so there's a study from Stanford University recently that put people kind of on a treadmill. Um, but first of all, they'd asked them to take a genetic test. And um, it looked at this gene called CREB1, which can influence endurance um, for a few different pathways like uh, people with the kind of negative variant uh, tend to have um, higher body temperature as they're exercising, which means they're a bit more uh, uncomfortable when they're exercising. And, you know, like uh, it seems to have an effect on things like the gas exchange within the lungs and just how kind of efficient their cardiovascular system is. Um, so they took the genetic test, but the researchers gave them sham feedback. So they didn't actually tell them the real results. So some were told, you know, that they had a great version of this gene that would mean they find exercise really easy. The others were told that they had the kind of bad version that um, was going to make it harder. 
And then what they found was that when they did this um, endurance exercise, naturally, those expectations were really important in shaping their physiological response and their sense of exertion. Um, so, you know, you could measure like how long they could manage to continue on the treadmill, um, whether they found it fatiguing, and also like the physiological differences in like the gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen within the lungs. And all of those things were shaped by those expectations. And actually, for some of the measures, um, including the gas exchange within the lungs, that was actually, the expectations were actually more important than the gene itself. Uh, so we know then that um, our expectations are really important in shaping our, our response to exercise and the feelings of fatigue that we have. And again, you know, part of that is coming from the uh, interpretation of the interoceptive signals. So if you have, um, you know, they can provide your brain with like the raw data, but then as with all perception, um, your expectations are determining how you kind of make sense of that data. And it could be that if you feel that you're just not naturally disposed to do exercise, that you're kind of catastrophizing actually pretty small changes in your physiology, pretty small changes in those interoceptive signals. And that's then causing this kind of feedback loop when the, the brain doesn't want the body to become too exhausted. So then it actually like puts the brakes on your movements and makes it harder um, to try to slow you down so you don't kind of use up all your uh, you know, energy and oxygen too quickly. Um, so yeah, it's definitely this communication between the brain and the body that's being shaped by our expectations that's determining fatigue there. Um, similarly, actually just with mental fatigue, which is very much related to physical fatigue, like we've known that for a century, mm -hmm. um, you can see something very similar. So people, um, you know, some people have this expectation that if they are concentrating and doing like a difficult mental task, that that will be inherently exhausting. And then because of that expectation, they do actually experience more fatigue more quickly. Whereas other people have this idea that actually like um, concentration and mental focus can also almost be like self-perpetuating. So like once you get into the zone and you're in the zone, it's just easy to keep going and actually becomes easier over time. And you find that those people with that expectation um, do indeed find that it is self-perpetuating and they can concentrate for longer. And then you can do these kind of intervention studies where you kind of manipulate people's beliefs and you find that actually then that produces a change in like how much fatigue people experience. So it is very much like our perceptions of fatigue uh, very much depend on our expectations. What we, what we expect, we actually get. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so there was another sort of really fun example of um, going back to it wasn't sort of more mental exhaustion, it was more physical exhaustion, the, the sham doping. Um, and the, was it a professional cyclist doing a time trial? Um, yeah, yeah. well, someone in the um, Tour de France, um, Richard Veronc, I think, um, who, I think he was part of a team. I don't know if he personally, um, there was definitely doping going on in that team at the time. But um, anyway, he heard of some kind of really good stuff that was going around the other teams and so asked um, his coach to get him some. Um, but the coach was like nervous about giving this kind of unknown substance in the middle. It wasn't the ethical um, considerations that bothered him. I think he just didn't want to give like a, you know, something that could potentially okay. like kill the guy or harm him. So he swapped the substance for just like um, uh, like uh, saline. Or or yeah, I think yeah, I think or like a glucose solution, but something that shouldn't have had any effect. And so he gave this injection in the uh, cyclist like bum. And then, like you know, he went and did his um, his trial, and he had the performance of his lifetime. Um, and it was only afterwards that um, the coach actually owned up and said, you know, like that, you know, it wasn't this kind of magic potion; it was just like salt water or whatever. Um, but that was purely this guy's expectations that were then changing how his body was reacting um, to the challenges of the task. Um, and you know, now the, that's anecdotal, but there are lots of studies showing that actually placebos are really powerful within exercise. Um, through the mechanisms that I mentioned, it's changing your, your brain's expectations of what your body can achieve. And then that in turn is doing things like um, changing how many muscle fibers are gonna be recruited during the exercise, um, as well as maybe like controlling how efficient your cardiovascular system is to um, achieve that goal and to pump the oxygen around your body. And even things like the efficiency of your movements change according to 
how good you think you are at sports. So if you tell someone that they're naturally athletic and great at running, you actually see that they move their limbs faster while consuming less energy um, through some kind of expectation effect. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I, I imagine how all these things can be com uh, combined and layered on top of each other um, mm. as well. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a sucker for new, uh, supplements and stuff that um, may be good for me. And in the past, I've maybe worried a little bit about, oh, you know, is there enough evidence of other, other studies placebo controlled? But as now I'm a little bit, after reading your book, I'm a little bit more relaxed. I'm like, oh, I'll just take it anyway. And even if it's placebo, it's great. <laughs> and if it's giving yeah. me the confidence boost, then fantastic. Well, yeah, and there's actually studies that have looked at um, open-label placebos in sports. And, you know, it did seem to be effective, like it had been in those studies of pain. So actually people knowing that they were taking a placebo, but also understanding that that could be effective by changing the, um, the mind's expectations and by tweaking the mind-body connection. Yeah, uh, so definitely that's how I see it now is that, um, you know, I think in general, like the testing of supplements isn't that, you know, rigorous. Um, so I just try to like take the things that I think are like make me feel good or, you know, use like the gear or whatever that I think leaves me feeling empowered without worrying too much about the evidence behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. I was speaking yesterday to someone from um, – James White, which is a, uh, they make ve organic vegetable juices and they've got oh, this yeah. beet it sport, their little shots of beetroot juice. Right. Yeah. And they have actually made, done some studies with universities with oh, uh, yeah. placebo bottles. So they, mm. they create them, they look exactly the same, they're purple juice, but they've got no nitrates in oh, compared yeah. to the um, beetroot juice and shown that they have a positive effect. But, you mm. know, I was thinking sometimes if I'm, if I'm doing a race or a competition, I'm going to just take some anyway and just yeah. know that it's a bit like a ritual you talked about rituals as well mm -hmm. so sports professionals and um or even yourself having a ritual of counting your coffee beans before you you're right. right so how can we um have you got any tips for using rituals in a in a helpful way yeah sure so i mean rituals in a way are like a bit like a placebo um and you know what the research has shown is that actually much like an open label placebo, that you don't have to be uh, superstitious to benefit from uh, from forming these rituals. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. One of um, them is, I think, the heightened expectations. But I also think another one is that we, um, when you're performing a ritual, it's kind of helping to block some of the kind of negative chatter within okay. your brain. So it's even if you have the kind of negative expectations, it's stopping you from dwelling on them too much, which is itself really helpful and also just like performing this kind of really rigid routine um can itself just feel like you're imposing control on an unpredictable situation like you can't you can't like control all of the elements that are gonna influence like a game of basketball or a race or for me like my you know um the kind of creativity of writing like you know there's always that kind of blank page well i can't do anything to like ensure that i'm going to be creative on any particular day but by counting my coffee beans like at the start of the day uh, to make my espresso, it's like imposing some kind of order that then just leaves me feel, feeling a bit more empowered. Um, and that has been shown to, um, to be really effective. The coffee bean counting, by the way, isn't just like my own mad invention. Um, it's what Mozart apparently did. So, <laughs> but, and you know, then I thought, actually, it's an easy one to apply. So, yeah. But I mean, like, just to give one example from the scientific literature um, to show that this was effective. So... Um, the researchers asked these um, participants in, like students, to come and do karaoke, which most people find uh, pretty cringeworthy. Um, but some of them were just told to do this like daft ritual of like drawing a picture of how they feel, uh, sprinkling salt on it, like um, tearing it up, and then throwing it in the bin. Um, mm -hmm. And they not only felt less anxious, but they actually performed like considerably better at the karaoke. So they were more like pitch perfect than the participants who were just sitting there kind of waiting without performing the ritual so mm. it was just helping to give them that kind of mental focus sense mm. of control that then improved their singing mm. Mm. yeah i think that yeah that focus it's almost um guiding them into the activity isn't it in a in mm. a way that's yeah po positive you worked your way towards the topic of aging at the end of the book 
And I hadn't heard of Paddy Jones before, but after um, reading the chapter on aging, I, I looked her up on YouTube and watched some of her videos with, with uh, my mum. And I must admit, just watching this 87-year-old woman being thrown around by someone just yeah. made me feel that I could do more when I was working out at the gym the next <laughs> few yeah. days. So can you sort of share some examples around um, how expectation um, and aging can maybe even affect our life expectancy? Yeah, sure. Um, so Paddy Jones, you know, like was one of the most inspirational people I spoke to for my um, book, and she's just got such a great outlook. So she's the world's um, oldest acrobatic salsa dancer, and she's performed in like um, the San Remo Music Festival, you know, which is huge in Italy, um, and kind of um, the equivalents of like Strictly Come Dancing and like uh, Spain and Brazil, you know, all of these, like uh, Argentina, like she's, you know, traveled the world performing, um, but she only started um, doing these kind of uh, salsa dancing lessons, like when she was already in her 60s. So, you know, it wasn't like she had always been dancing and keeping up her fitness. It was actually a response to her husband dying and she was trying to look for something positive to do with her life. And and then that became like the kind of second love of her life almost was this dancing. Um, so that is really inspiring. And, you know, she'd always said it was like she just didn't feel her age, so she wasn't going to act it. Um, but then there's lots of scientific research showing that, you know, there's more to this than just like uh, one case study. Um mm -hmm. So there's longitudinal studies that have looked at people, um, you know, over decades of their lives. And they found that actually their attitudes to aging, like early on in their life can affect their kind of um, susceptibility to uh, disease, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, disability, kind of much later on in their 70s and 80s. And it even affects their longevity. So people with negative views of aging tend to die around seven and a half years earlier than people who have the positive views of aging. Um, so like, what are these views of aging? Well, the negative ones is where you look at aging as purely full of like disability, decline and vulnerability. So you just assume that life is gonna get worse in every way. Um, the people with the positive views of aging, I don't think they're necessarily denying that some things get a bit more challenging as you get older, but they're also seeing like opportunity for growth in aging. Um, so they might, and this is true, they might recognize that actually things like your um, general knowledge and your vocabulary and your decision making abilities actually peak when you're in your 70s and 80s, you know, so it's not all about the kind of memory loss, actually, like there's lots of things that um, only get better as you get older. And also, you know, you can have a lot of, you can try to keep your independence and you can try new activities as you get older, you know, there's lots, lots that you could be celebrating, but uh, many people ignored that side of aging. Um, and we know that the, this then seems to affect our behavior. So if you are kind of defeatist about aging, you're less likely to take care of your health and to, you know, do exercise. Well, that in itself is going to like leave you more open to, um, uh, to disability for a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but also there's this kind of direct physiological route here. And that's that if you associate aging with vulnerability, um, just everything around you is going to feel more challenging and scary and threatening. You know, every everything that you have to do in your life is going to feel more difficult. So that's going to produce um, a kind of unhealthy level of stress within your life. That, and because it's chronic stress, we know that that can cause wear and tear on our cells. And you do actually see then these effects on people's cells. So things like the length of the telomeres, um, those protective caps at the end of chromosomes, uh, that seems to depend on people's um, aging beliefs. So if people have a positive view of aging, they tend to be longer. If they have a negative view of aging, they tend to be shorter and get much shorter over time. And we know that that can then like, um, once they get very short, that that can uh, lead to kind of cell death or kind of um, a different kind of uh, uh, malfunctioning within the cell that can lead to illness. Um, the same with epigenetic markers. So the ways the genes are being expressed, we know that that uh, we call it like the kind of epigenetic clock that ticks more quickly for the people with the negative views of aging, probably because of the high levels of stress and then inflammation that come from feeling that you're vulnerable. Uh, in your book, um, you had some of those questions that were asked in the, the studies or those statements around aging. So um, anyone who wants to uh, read the book and work your way through them, you can turn them into positive mantras, I suppose, that, um, that you could kind of 
decide to uh, build your views and beliefs around aging around um, I really like the way that you described it that some things improve with age and it's got like this idea of being you know vintage wine being better than uh, <laughs> right. yeah. than new wine exactly and you know I think hearing about people like Paddy Jones can be very um, inspiring um, I also think like that once we become aware of this we can also start to just question the uh, kind of stereotypes within our culture because um, like we live in an incredibly ageist culture. And I think it's one of these prejudices that is still rampant and socially acceptable, even though we now know from this huge body of evidence that is actually causing a huge amount of damage to other people's health and eventually it will damage our own health as well. So it's really counterproductive. Um, it's, you know, all kinds of prejudice are unacceptable. And then, you know, if it's also affecting our health in this way, like it really needs to be tackled. Um, and I think just understanding this can help us to question when, you know, we come across one, one of these ageist beliefs and hopefully prevent us from transmitting it to other people and from internalizing it ourselves. Mm, yeah. And the same for any other type of prejudice or, you know, unconscious mm. bias, whether it's racism, homophobia, or any, any kind of uh, belief that may not be, be true. Yeah. Um, you mentioned epigenetics there, so I don't expect you to have a, an answer for what I'm about to ask, but um yeah. You've talked about, you know, how our beliefs can change very real, very real things in our in our body and uh, maybe even change these, you know, set points on our body's thermostats, these allostatic kind of variables. Um, so what what do you think is the, the boundary between expectation and biological limits? Is it something that we can keep on nudging in different ways or are there will there eventually be physical limits? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely physical limits. Um, you know, like I think everything I've mentioned in the expectation effect has like a known physiological pathway. Um, so we know that the brain can do things like change, you know, blood pressure. And, you know, like you see that every day. Like if, you're, if you think about something that's stressing you out and scaring you, like your blood pressure is going to go up. And the, expe the expectation effects I'm describing are just showing how actually like over a, a long time, over days and years, that those kinds of things can, you know, create like a, not just a momentary change, but can actually then predispose you to certain illnesses or um, improve your health. So and the same with, you know, like changes in stress hormones, um, you know, changes to our digestion. Um, you know, all of these things are like very well understood. Um, but, and so I think that is profound, you know, if you're changing the way people respond to diets and exercise and stress and aging, you know, we, that's, that's like incredible, but we don't have to then go to the extreme, which a lot of people do who don't have a scientific background um, and claim that, say, your thoughts alone can cure something like cancer, like a terminal illness like cancer. It's just there's no good mechanism there how if you've got a tumour that your thoughts alone are going to suddenly remove that tumour because like the brain can definitely change like your immune system. It can tweak your immune system, but it can't suddenly produce such huge changes that is going to directly target this tumour within your body. So, you know, I think that's the kind of limit. I mean, there's so many other limits, but I'd say that's the most obvious one for me and the biggest kind of misunderstanding that there has been is when people feel that, say, changing their attitudes, um, you know, to life are going to kind of help them to beat a terminal illness like that. And it's mm -hmm. like, if there haven't, I basically, I would say, if there haven't been the scientific studies proving an expectation effect, kind of be wary about it hoping that it's going to happen um and that's you know basically in my book i just try to set those boundaries to say what we do know and like what we don't know um and like what we do know is it can be really profound but it doesn't mean it can perform like pure miracles you know be realistically optimistic exactly yeah same with fitness you know like if you change your mindset to exercise that, that is going to be super helpful for you doing workouts and you know i found it myself like changing my mindset to exercise has helped me to kind of exercise kind of every day and that's been and to improve my performance but like going into the gym telling myself I was going to be like Tom Daly or something <laughs> um that was not ever going to happen and was only going to lead to disappointment like I could never become like an Olympian especially at 36 years old like you know I can't pretend that my mindset can produce that kind of miraculous change but actually like what the changes it does produce like helping me to get fitter and to enjoy exercise that in itself is going to like extend my life. And I think that is more than enough uh, reason to be practicing the expectation effect. 
Mm. So is it, you know, are, are those two things tracking, you know, what, what, what we want out of life and what uh, we're experiencing um, in our bodies? Are they tracking nicely against each other? Yeah, exactly. And it's just kind of, it's helping you to make the most of the other interventions that we know are really powerful, but the expectation effect alone isn't going to, you know, like you can't just think yourself fit and not do the exercise essentially. So that's <laughs> another boundary. You know, it's like we have to use it sensibly and intelligently alongside all of the other things we know about the human body. So what's uh, you've written the expectation effect and it's a, it's a great book, highly recommend it, but what's on you, what's on the horizon for you work-wise now? Is there another book coming out or uh, any special topics you're interested in? Mm, uh so um, one of the projects I've been working on is a video book is coming out for the Intelligence Trap. So that was my first book. Um, so I've just been recording the um, kind of dialogue for that. So it's, um, it's basically like a, an abridged version of the book, uh, but it's presented in like this beautiful kind of video format with animations mm -hmm. and stuff. And then with like face-to-face -face interviews with some of the people who I spoke to for the book. Um, so I'm excited about that. Should come out later this year. It's through um, Lit Video. Uh, through lit video and where else can people find your work do you have a website or social media channels people can um, find you on yeah so I'm uh, most active on twitter I guess um, so that's uh, d underscore a underscore robson and my website is uh, davidrobson.me um, you know and I do love hearing from readers I found you uh, particularly approachable so it's, it's I'm really grateful that you've made time uh, to to join us today and uh, I just want to finish by thanking you very much and again appreciating the the great message that you're getting across through the expectation effect yeah that's no, completely been my pleasure and I've really enjoyed the conversation so yeah thank you